They're not wearing red and black. Um, so last week's comparison between image and identity was that image is all talk and identity is action. And it was in a long line of image and identity messages that I've done. Um, I kind of started with this premise that the church doesn't have an image problem. As Christians in a postmodern culture, we don't have an image problem. We have an identity problem. That we're, we're so concerned about some kind of image that we, don't, we haven't grown an identity in Christ. And, and identity comes from the inside and it works its way outside. Image starts outside and really never does work its way inside. And so we talked about what image that we would like as a local church, or maybe what it's what I would like, what I want to see in a local church, what I would believe um, is should be all of our identities in Christ. And we wa- I'll walk through some of them. Here are the here are the four before today. Talked about being a people of transformation, a people of a changed nature, that Christ changes our nature, and that when our nature gets changed, we change. Although there's still some work in that, isn't there? And we talked about sowing to the spirit as opposed to sowing to the flesh and allowing our, our nature to be changed and allowing that to change our identity. And that's where it all starts. And I talked about becoming people of the book. That in a postmodern culture where someone can hold two, two things that actually oppose one another and count them both as truth. Where you can have your truth and I can have my truth. That truth is individual and not overarching is a necessity of why we become a people of the book. That we understand what the truth is. It's a, there's a proverb I've quote, I quote quite a bit that says that the first person to present their case seems right until the truth gets presented. Actually, I think the proverb says until it's excuse me, cross-examined, cross-examined with the truth. So I want us to become people of the book that we know the reason for the hope that's inside of us. The next one we talked about is becoming a people of worship. Jesus said that if I be lifted up, all men would be drawn to me. Worship is drawing attention to who God is. And we're in a Western culture that we lift ourselves up. Worship looks a whole lot like worshiping ourselves than it does anything else. And I I made the statement that by the very nature you decided today to be in this room together was an act and a statement of worship. That we assigned worth to God, our time together in honoring Him. And what you worship draws people's attention. If you worship your car, it draws people's attention to your car. If you worship your house, it draws people's attention to your house. You worship your kids, happens in our culture, doesn't it? Draw your attention to the kids. Whatever we worship, we draw attention to. Very specifically, we talked about why was false worship so um, um, disturbing to God. It's because in the Psalms it says we become like we worship. We become like who we worship. And so he is interested in what we become. So we talked about becoming a people of worship. And last week we talked about becoming a people of love and service. That as we are the body of Christ, and John, Jesus said that um, they will know that you're my disciples by your love one for another. And he commanded us to love one another. We talked about it out of 1 Peter chapter 3. And he said that we are to love one another deeply. And what that meant was that we we were to love one another without conditions, and without limits, aggressively, and purposefully. Now that would be an amazing sight, wouldn't it? That each Sunday or any time that we're together with fellow followers of Christ, that we would love without condition, without limit, purposefully, and aggressively love and serve one another. And that is a distinctive of the body of Christ. We were very specific that how do I, how do, I do that? I might, might not even know you. How, how am I supposed to love you in that manner if there's no emotion connected to you? We said that it's a command. And so with a command with Christ, as we step out in obedience, he backfills with emotion. You with me? So when I obey and step out and love you unconditionally, without condition, without limits, aggressively and purposely, I don't do that out of emotion. I do that out of obedience because that's, that's what he's given me. And when I do that like that way, he backfills with the emotion. And today we're going to talk about the last one. The last identity would be becoming a people of commission. Now, it sounds better to say people of mission. But when I, when I went through this even deeper, commission makes more sense because we're joined in a mission with Christ. It's not our own individual mission. Mankind's two greatest needs are to be loved and to be significant, to be important, okay? Two greatest needs, to be loved and to be significant. 
The interesting thing about these two needs is we can't fill them ourselves. We, we can't fill the need to love ourselves at an extent that would fill us. And there isn't anything that we can do that will make us be, feel significant. We have to be loved by someone else, and we have to do something and serve someone in order to be significant. So it's really not in our capacity to fill these two needs. So where does it come from? They come from being filled by Christ. Then regardless of how loved you feel by your spouse or your parents or whatever, there is only one love that fills us, and that's the love of Christ. And then there's only one thing that I have in front of me to do that will have any eternal consequences or significance. And that's what I do for someone else in the name of Christ. That's the only thing that's going to carry on eternally. And so true significance is something that isn't one and done on a weekend 5K. Right? I really believe that we, we, we live in a culture that is longing, longing for a purpose, but they settle for a cause. Just something that comes by and I can latch myself to it and the cause is done and somehow I feel better because I got in the matching t-shirt and I did the thing. But God's calling us to a bigger purpose and that purpose is how we engage others for him. Today on this last marker, it really comes out of, the, the terminology I'm going to use, comes out of a discussion that the, the Apostle Paul, in his conversion, after he talk, he's talking about his conversion, after when he was arrested. He was arrested. Years later, he was on trial before a king, King Agrippa. And King Agrippa is kind of wanting to know, look, I knew who you were. I knew your reputation beforehand. Now, this is not who you were beforehand. I need you to tell me why you're doing what you're doing and how all this has transpired. And Paul even being under arrest, he's like, this is a great opportunity. And so he goes into a little of his story. We find it in Acts 26. He says, on one of these journeys, so now he's, he's responding to a specific question by King Agrippa. Like, why are you different? Okay, and here, here's his answer. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up, stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And there's the mission. Paul understood it plainly because Jesus outlined it very plainly to him. Paul, here's your mission. The go turn people from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. There it is. That's yours. You were commissioned to destroy the church. I'm commissioning you to change this and turn this whole thing on its ear. You ready? And there's the mission. And it's the same mission that he invites you and I to, that we co-mission with him in turning people from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. And that's the mission we are to align with, and it becomes, I think, a core identity factor as us as believers and as a church, okay? So how would we go about living out that identity? I think Jesus mirrors through, through, throughout his life in the Gospels that we have recorded, and I'm going to read three or four stories, tell us three or four stories, because it outlines, it outlines a little bit about how Jesus went about mission and how he joins us in that mission, all right? So the first one I want to read is out of uh, Luke 10. Now, most people would refer to this, if, you, if you've read the Bible some, you'd refer to it as the Good Samaritan page, pa, pa, uh, passage. I liken it better to a commercial, um, the, the uh, State Farm commercials. Right? And you may be in the insurance business, this might, might, but it might not be your company, and so I apologize, but the State Farm guy paid me more, right? Sure. So, not, <laughs> just kidding. But right, aren't they pretty good commercials, right? And they sing the jingle, State Farm, you know, and, and then the agent pops up. And, Really, they're trying to convey this personal sense of the insurance agent with that, right? Well, Jesus, in this passage, is going to demonstrate that a core identity of his is that Jesus was hands-on. See, in John 1, which I, I quote a lot out of the message, the message says that he became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. 
Another, another version or translation would say that he made his, became flesh and made his dwelling amongst, amongst us. So basically it dismisses this myth that Jesus and God is a disengaged, distant person, but that he is a, in our face, in our flesh, in our mess, hands-on participant with us. And his mission begins like that. And so the story he's about to tell is a story that identifies how we are to go about our commission. That we're to be hands-on, involved. See, image is always concerned about what it looks like. Image is always concerned about who I'm around, or you know, I don't want to get my image messed up. And identity doesn't give a rip about image. Why? Well, so Jesus was accused oftentimes, right? Why are you hanging out with tax collectors and prostitutes, publican sinners? It's because he was disinterested in image. The idea of him being dirtied by being around other people was more of what his identity was about being in the flesh than anything to do about what he cared about what anybody else thought or said. So identity is core, image is surface. So here's the story. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? Jesus was the king of answering questions with questions. He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. I can almost see Jesus finishing the answer. Do this and you will live. And the guy asks one more question. The one question he did not want to hear the answer to. He asked the question, well, who's my neighbor? See, when you just think about what, do I, what does it take to inherit eternal life, love the God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love your neighbor yourself, immediately I'm going, I can't do that. I love myself too much, right? We all do. We all love ourselves too much. How is it possible for me to love my neighbor like myself? I'm not going to be able to do that unless, of course, we draw a very, very small circle about who gets that kind of love. If I can draw that circle small enough, i got a chance of fulfilling it. And so his question was, I need, who, who goes in my circle? Well, I think Jesus turns around and says, well, let me tell you a little story. And so here's the story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Jesus finished his story, goes back to the questions. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor? And here's the switch. Here's the shell game. You asked, who was my neighbor? What I'm trying to get you to understand is, who was the neighbor? Who's going to act like that? Not who's going to receive that. And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now I believe this expert in the law was the guy now who turned to walk away. He's asking the question, how do I limit who I have to treat with this kind of love you're talking about? And Jesus turns the tables and says, this is how you ought to be, not what you, who you ought to do this for. This is who you should be. Now, the story would have been pretty well known, not necessarily because Jesus ripped it from the headlines, but this something was something that could have been ripped from the headlines. This was a notorious path. This, it, this very well could have happened. It probably did happen. Jesus is telling it as a parable. But the reason why it hit home so much is because it very likely could have happened. And I want you to think about it. The first thing Jesus is doing is exposing the hypocrisy of people who would love on the inside. We'd come into church and wave our hands and avoid someone on the outside. He's exposing it as the Jew re- religious leaders just walking away from another Jew that was in harm. He's exposing the hypocrisy. That he's basically saying, that ain't church. That is not a follower of mine. And he rubs some salt in the wound by taking a Samaritan, someone who would have been, the Jew would have avoided. 
And the Samaritans should have avoided the Jew because they had nothing to do with one another. They considered themselves, um, the Jewish considered them religiously um, uh, mixed and, and, and would not have anything to do with a Samaritan. And yet it's the Samaritan who responds. So after he exposes the hypocrisy, he gets right down to really what it means to be merciful. Gentlemen, ladies, you're on a business meeting. You got your little roll away. This guy probably had his little roll away. And how does he bandage the man's wounds? He goes in there and gets his white starched dress shirt and he tears it into bandages. He gets into his own stash of wine and oil and prepares the wound. But then he puts him on his donkey, which means he had the donkey probably, he's either carrying goods or maybe it was prepping to bring goods back, who knows, but he would have had to shift the weight on the donkey so that the man could have been on the donkey but it's not over. Then he takes him to the end. He doesn't drop him off, drop him off at the end. He said, hey, I found this guy on the side of the road. Someone called 911. He's saying, here, I'm going to pay you for his care. And he doesn't stop and just kind of giving him a credit card number. He basically says, listen, and, and you take good care of him. And if what you spend is more than what I've given you, when I get back from this meeting... I'll stop back by here and I'll take care of anything else, which means that he's not just making a presentation when he gets there and his mind focused on his business. His mind is circling about how that man was. Was he being taken care of? Was he, was he, was he being healed? What's going on? With that? I, can't, I can't wait to get back to the man. And one of the things Jesus is teaching us about commission is that we have to be present and we have to participate. That's what Jesus is demonstrating, that he's hands-on in the mess with his presence, and he's participating. He's not walking by. And so when we share in his commission, if this is going to be people of an identity, um, that we're going to carry this identity of Christ, that we have to be willing to be present in somebody's life, be able to participate in the mess that's going on, even at our own expense, time, emotion, that marks people of identity. Mercy is not indifference, and it's not merely pity, but it's action driven by presence and participation. So let's go to another story. Another story where Jesus kind of still kind of fleshes out this idea of being on mission with him. In John chapter 4, it begins by saying he must needs go through Samaria. And, he, and, and this, the way the story goes is now Jesus is going to have another encounter with another Samarian, this time a woman. And as the disciples and Jesus are going on their destination and they're going through Samaria, he gets tired around a well. He sits down and the guys, he sends the guys on into town to get him food. In this process, no doubt the disciples passed by this woman coming to draw water from the well. Why was she coming outside of town? And the scriptures talks about it was around noon. It was in the heat of the day. This would have been uncommon. The wo a woman would not have gone, drawn water outside of the town in that kind of heat, except there was other things going on in her life. And in the conversation of time between Jesus and this woman, Jesus says, first of all, he says, hey, would you give me a drink? Well, it was a logical question. He's sitting at a well. He's tired. He's thirsty. He doesn't have anything to draw the water with, but she does. She's come with her jar, and she's come with her stuff to draw water. But she's surprised by the ask because, one, he was a rabbi, and the Jews and the Samaritans would not have this contact. And then if he would drink from something that she had, he would also be unclean. She is completely caught off guard that Jesus would ask her for water. And in the course of the conversation, Jesus ends up kind of revealing who he is to her. At one particular point, she starts asking him religious questions. And I, I told the early service, I try to withhold the information that I'm a pastor to any new contact or relationship I have for as long as possible. Right? I'm a good liar. Right. Here's, here's why. As soon as I say I'm a pastor, everything changes. People sit up straight, you know, posture changes, you know, and they start talking nice and telling me all about where their grandmother went to church. I mean, I, I just get, get, and when I do it on the golf course, they start, they start hitting the ball all over the place once I tell them I'm a pastor. So I use it strategically, depending on... <laughs> So she starts asking him religious questions. And, and sometimes you've got to understand that when you start getting asked religious questions, it has nothing to do with really what they're asking. And so he says, you know what, why don't you get your husband and let's talk. And she goes, oh, well, um, basically in my vernacular, she says, well, I'm not married. And he goes, oh, no, I know. Actually, you've been married five times. And the guy you're living with right now, yeah, you're not married. 
So immediately she's like, dude's all up in my business. And, you know, wait a minute. Could, are you the Messiah? You're, you're the Messiah. You are. You're the Messiah. You're the, you are the Messiah. She, she leaves her water jars, everything she would have taken to the well, and she is so blown away, she runs back into town to tell everybody, let me, let me tell you, i got to introduce you to the guy who told me everything about my life. That there's no way he could have known it. This guy is the Messiah. One of the interesting things about where the church, where Christians sometimes stop too soon, we, we, we sometimes get the mercy component, the presence component, participate, we'll get in your mess, but we stop short of giving the message of Christ. See, Jesus, in this process, he introduced, he reveals himself that he is the Messiah. And if she really wanted water, you know, that he offered that she'd never thirst again, he'd give her that water. He'd give him himself if she wanted himself and not just this water coming out of the well. We can't stop short of giving the message of Christ. See, if I'm just nice and compassionate and, 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 and do nice things for you and I never give the message of Christ, who does it really ultimately point, point them to? Me, right? I'm a nice guy. Oh, um, Charlie, he's so compassionate. You know, instead of, well, you know what? There's, there's a reason why I'm able to do this for you. And there's a purpose for why I'm doing this with you. It's because I've received this from Christ. He's changed me. I don't have the heart to do this, but I have the heart because of him. See, Jesus is introducing right off the bat that we, with the mercy, we also give message. Now, on the way back, she's on her way this way. The disciples are on the way to him. And on their, when they're away, he says... Um, so just then, verse 27, just then his disciples returned. So she's on her way into town to say, hey, I found the Messiah. They're on their way, they're on their way back with, you know, McDonald's, right? And so just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why you're talking to, with her? They probably asked him questions like that before and he, you know, didn't like the answer. So he, they left alone. And he said, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back. And so she does all that. And then verse 31, meanwhile, the disciples urged him, he, Rabbi, eat something. Like, you sent us after food, you're tired, you sat down, we've ate the French fries, we've eaten the French fries on the way back, right? So we, we've, we've made that, and we've brought you whatever we have left, and you need to eat something. And Jesus responds and says, you know what, guys, I'm full. Now, wait, wait, what? If you're full, I mean, who delivered that? I mean, why, you know, why did you send us there if you were going to order takeout somewhere else and someone else is going to, you know, why are you full? And he kind of exposes to them why he's full. See, it's, it's when I told you that one of our greatest needs is to feel significant, Jesus is introducing what makes us feel significant. That when he revealed himself to her, that was all the food he needed. He was completely filled up. And sometimes I believe as followers of Christ, there's two things that happen with followers of Christ, I think. One is sometimes God, if we think about the Old Testament, God starts moving the cloud and the, and the pillar of fire in the desert to move the people on. And sometimes the, the reason why you get bored in your faith is you say you're not going anywhere else. That you're just going to, I'm going to plop in, I'm going to draw the square, and Lord, you can move on if you want to move on, but I'm going to stay put for a while. And I think we get bored and we can fall away from our, you know, our passion for Christ. The second is that when we just decide, you know, you know I'm not going to share, I, I can't share my faith. It's too much for me to share my faith. I, I, well, they're going to ask me questions I don't know, and I, I don't want to engage. And but that's the purpose we've, called, we've been called to. So then Jesus throws a few more things to them that's pretty amazing. He goes on to say, verse 34, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months into the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows, another reaps. And it's true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you've reaped the benefit of their labor. This is one of the most significant passages to me. It's, it's, it, has, it has shaped so much of my life. Two, two things. One, Jesus is adding a go mission to our co-mission. Okay? Because at the beginning, he said he must needs go through the Samaria. And the first story that I told you, th the person happened on a need, right? Happened on a need. In this instance, Jesus went specifically to have this conversation with this woman and to teach this thing to the disciples. And he said, I know that you haven't sown in these fields, but they're white. But see, listen, the Holy Spirit's more interested in someone else coming to Christ than you and I will ever be. 
already at work, already doing. You do not know how many conversations that you pass up and that I pass up when, the, when, when God was just, they were ripe. I mean, they were ready for the conversation. I can't tell you how many times I've engaged in a conversation reluctantly, only about three or four questions in realized God has just set this whole, whole thing up. They are, they are ready for a conversation. And then there's times that they're not, and I've been a part of the conversation that helps set it up for the next conversation. But I think it's important for all of us to understand that the fields are white and to harvest, that there are people ready to hear this message. Let's go on to the next story. It's recorded in Matthew 9, 35 through 38. Jesus is still layering for me what it means for us to be in commission for him, with him. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Jesus is in this next group doing his thing. He's healing, he's teaching, he's doing his thing. And in the, in the midst of him doing his thing, and all the disciples probably organizing lines, right, and getting people, you know, in some kind of order to get to Jesus and all this stuff, Jesus looks up. And he peels back the layer of the facade of people's lives. And he sees what's really going on. He sees people's helpless. Helpless. That they're in a situation that they can do nothing about in and of themselves. He sees them as harassed, in conflict, badgered, things coming at them from all sides. And he sees them as sheep without a shepherd, aimless, no one really to look after them, no one to protect them. And see, how many times we go through life and we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't see behind the scenes of people's lives, right? We just see the pretty house or the pretty fence or the pretty car, or the Facebook posts, right, where we all put all true things, right? It's all, it's all true, everything you see, right? right? You know, who's going to peel that back to see where, who's hurting? We, get, we can get so caught up in our own life and that we just kind of see the mirage or the image of someone else's life, and we think everything's fine, we just move on. And Jesus, in this passage, he's doing his thing, people are coming and going, and he just kind of lifts his eyes up, and he sees people for who they really are and what they're actually walking through. No one's going to give you what's going on on the inside first pass. The high how are yous always get met with fine thank you. And we're entering the season... In our little world, where we, we go through the neighborhood because of the weather's turning, and we give the little wave, right? Give a little wave, we hit the garage door opener. Garage door goes up, we drive in, we hit the garage door opener, garage door goes down, see in the spring. See you three or four months. We're going to work. We got our blinders on. There's stuff that's got to get done. We got to get it done. We got to meet that deadline. And we go after it. And Jesus, in this passage, I think he's trying to teach all of us you got to look deeper. If you're going to be present and participate and go in this mission, you got to look a little deeper. You've got to pause. You got to see in all the business of life that there are people that are helpless, harassed, and a sheep without a shepherd. And then he turns to the disciples and says, guess what, guys? This is after he would have said the fields are white in the harvest. He says, guess what, guys? There's too much work for just you. Twelve of you ain't going to get this done. 120 of you aren't going to get this done. Some would put that Jesus' influence and in specific would have maybe went to the 500 that he, that he revealed himself to after the, after the resurrection. So even to the 500, he's saying, there's more than you can do. I'm, a, I'm, I'm responding. My life is a response to someone praying. More people in the harvest. Worker. Your life is going to be the response of people praying for you. Asking, Lord, send more people into the harvest field. Fields are white. There's nothing wrong with the harvest. 
It's just, there's not enough of us with the identity of Christ that's going to enter into that field, get our hands dirty, get involved with someone. And the last, the last story is in Luke chapter 19, 41 through 44. This, was, this would have been Jesus entering into Jerusalem for the last time. This would have been, just before the last Passover, this would have been what, what sometimes is called as a triumphant entry. Okay? As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he would have been approaching from a higher kind of plateau and would, would have been descending into the city. It says he wept over it. And he said, even you, talking to a city, even you, If you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. He's passed now speaking to religious elite He's past trying to shape his disciples in the mission. Now his time is about done. And he comes into the city and he weeps over a nation. Here's how that struck me this week. I'm not a big, I'm not a, I'm not a political junkie. But I've been, wa- I watch, I've been watching all the debates. And I've been very cynical. And I've been I'm very sarcastic in that regard. I see news reports of legislation actually being pushed through in certain states about, you know, if, if, a, if a, a man thinks he's a woman, he should be able to enter into a woman's restaurant. If he thinks, if he thinks he's a woman, and, and I'm seeing all this stuff, and I don't know about you, but sometimes you can, get, you can get angry. You can give up. You can say this it is just too far gone. Think it's just, it's just too far gone. But what does Jesus do? Jesus had every opportunity to kind of wipe his hands of everything. But what does he do? He enters a city to give himself up for the very people, for the very people that rejected him, the very people that said, you aren't who you, you're not who you say you are. And he weeps. And I come back around and I think to myself, and maybe for you, I don't know, there's not enough crying going on for our nation. There's a lot of cynicism, a lot of negativity, a lot of mudslinging, a lot of I can't believe they would think that, I can't believe they'd do that, but I don't know how much crying is going on. It's challenging to me. Jesus would weep and then give himself up for that. And there's our call. That we're to be hands-on, to participate, to be in the mess that's around us, to not walk by, but to engage. Not just engage what we come in, 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 in grips with, what, what, what we see, but actually go, actually participate by going. To look up and see that the fields are white. We need to get our hands dirty. And then do a little bit more crying and a little bit more praying than we do cynicism and skepticism. I know the culture seems impenetrable, but this is the culture you and I are born into. I had a professor that did a lot of shaping in my life. His name's Leonard Sweet. Leonard Sweet said that he would have much rather been born during the Renaissance. He saw himself much more in that kind of culture, in the Renaissance culture. He said, but you know what? God's put me in this culture. He's put me in a postmodern culture to understand this world and what's going on in this world, and I accept that call. You know what? You might have wanted to be born in the 20s or the 40s or the 50s. or Maybe you were. Um, you know, <laughs> you might have wanted to be born during a time where the things were supposed to be brighter and, and better, and, but this is our time, guys. People asked me when I first moved to Franklin, why are you going to put another church in Franklin? I got to ask that question which was nine and a half years ago. We, believe it or not, we started trying to plant Gateway well before we had our first service in April of 07. And the only question I come, come up with, the only answer I come up with at the beginning with, because it was pretty a pretty sarcastic question I got asked, 
At that time, they were building banks hand over fist. I mean, every corner there was. It was either going to be a Rite Aid or Walgreens or a bank. And so I just made the observation. I said, how many banks does one town need? I mean, there's every branch imaginable on every corner. Why are there so many banks? Well, banks and fast food restaurants go where there's people. And so, really, do we really feel like there's enough gospel presence anywhere that we would say, let's not put another church? I will say this. No area needs another church with an image. Just an image to uphold. This culture smells that stuff a mile away. But there is a drastic need for identity. That there would be a people that would have a change in nature. And they would sow to that nature. And they would grow more and more into who the person Christ has called us to be. There is a need for people to be people of the book. That we would understand the truth. And when we would give an answer, as, as Paul says, to be ready to give a reason for the hope inside of you, he also says, then do so with gentleness and respect. People of the book. There would be people of worship that would truly point people not to a deaf, lifeless limbless idol called ourselves and point people that we would come into a room and worship the true and living God. And then when we were in here, whether we knew one another or not, we would love one another at such a degree that it would get people's attention. So you can't love and serve someone deeply without getting somebody's attention. You cannot overlook someone being loved and served deeply. It gets people's attention. That was his intent. Come on, Michael. That was his intent. So that they will know that you are my disciples. So now it's identity, isn't it? That's identity. And then a group of people that would say it's not enough to just draw our little circles around who we're going to do this to and with. See, isn't that, that was the problem the expert of the law had. He was wanting to limit his love liability. See, it'd be, it'd be easy if I could just draw the circle around Gene and Annie, right? I'd just draw the circle around Gene and Annie, and if I can love and serve Gene and Annie, then, then I'm, I'm, okay, well, but you're our pastor. Okay, so I'll draw, it a little, I'll draw it a little bigger to include all of you. But that's it. That's all, I'm, that's all I can handle. And God wants us, all of us, to keep drawing these circles. Not to limit our liability, but to reach a wide open white harvest field. I know why I don't engage sometimes. It's because it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. And it takes, you know, it takes all everything that you got to just get your own, get through your own stuff, right? And so how in the world can I take on somebody else's stuff if I can I can't even handle my own stuff? You remember at the very beginning of the message I said that the command to love you as followers of Christ comes as an obedience and God backfills with emotion, this is the same way. This is the same way. That if I would engage the people that God brings into my sphere, if I would get a vision to go, God backfills. He backfills with any information you feel like you lack. He's going to backfill with any compassion you don't think you have. God backfills when we step forward in obedience. So really the question that I got asked nine and a half years ago, why another church in Franklin? I have to pose to you, I posed it to the nine o'clock today, is now that we're here, we're no longer unloading trailers in or out. We've been two years in a legitimate location that would be the language that some would use around here. The question then is, so what? Who cares? I mean, is it just great we get to come to church and we don't have to haul chairs? Yes, take it from me. That is a good thing. But is that it? For those of you who walk through the years of Oakview Elementary School and you're still here with us, is this enough? If you've come over the last two years, is this enough? You got a nice little wood thing hanging over there we can put prayer requests on. And Is this enough? I can tell you for me it's not enough. An identity 
is what I'm after. I think you are too. I think you are too. So the way I really want to end it, I, w- I want you to, you got, you, you, got to re- you got to think about it. You can't just, you just can't pop up out of your seat. If you want these things that I talked about over these five weeks to become our identity as a church and your identity as a believer, and we're ready to truly, on an individual and corporate basis, engage with our presence and participation, the world around us, that we're going to cry more than we're going to complain. Someone needs to write that one down, right? We're going to cry more than we're going to complain. If you want to be a part of that kind of place, to make that happen, that identity, I want you to stand up with me. If that's the identity, and I I don't want you to take it lightly, because I don't want it to just be, you know, we popped up because Pastor asked. You know, um, I know we have guests in here. I get it. And, and, but I, now I want you, I want you to look around for a minute. Just, just look, take a look around with people standing up. Okay. And I want you to multiply that by two because that was at nine o'clock standing the same way you are. Now you tell me is a group of that size helpless? No. You know, I always thought about this. When I, when I didn't have any idea. People would say, what do you want the church look like? How many people you want? All these? I never had answers to any of these questions. But I did have one metric in my head, just one. And it wasn't like, how, how big do we want to be? Or what? I just, but I did have one metric that had a number in it. I said, Lord, I believe a church of 500 can do anything it wants to do. So that was the only metric in my head because I knew at the beginning it was, you know, you're getting people to serve and give and it was all struggle. But for some, in my mind, what I saw that a church of 500 was big enough to do anything it set its mind to do for God. Guess what? We're a church of 500. I find it interesting that was the only metric I ever had in my head. So really for me, it's now what? Now what do we do? Now what do we do? It's more than just hearing Michael write another song or our songwriters write another song and sing. What are we going to do? And I'm not put, I'm not, I didn't set any of these messages up to point us to Habitat or, or buy a tree, although those are things coming up. I, I'm not trying to point us to some event that we do as a church. I want you to open your eyes to the people around you. And that even this week in the closing prayer, that you would say, okay, God, is there someone? Show me. Show me someone I can engage. And do not be concerned about what that looks like or the end game in that. Just be concerned about doing the obedient part and let the Holy Spirit take care of the rest. You with me? Father, we have stood today. We have stood today as as Gateway Church. Lord, a church of, that we continue want it to be a church that looks like you and acts like you and loves like you and serves like you behaves like you Lord and I know that it's a process but Lord we work along this mission all along the process that it's not that we get to a certain place and all of a sudden we're qualified or good at it you've called us to be involved in the lives of our community the lives of uh, of our family the lives of our co-workers, the lives of the students that we attend school with, that we play on the team with. Lord, you've, you've just positioned us so well. Lord, today I ask that you would backfill all of what we need when we step out to obey. As a church and as individuals, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 I love you love our church. I love this place so much and um, my family does and we're grateful to be a part of it with you. To get alongside of you, get our hands dirty together in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're a guest with us today, Gina and I would love to have a chance to meet you right afterwards. Uh, we're going to be right outside these double doors. I never I never point out anybody, any family, but I have a I have a cousin from North Carolina, Evan Carroll. This is my, my mama's brother's boy and the oldest boy. He's with us in service today. First time he's been down in this neck of the woods. He's a Tar Heel, though. He's an ACC guy. So, you know, just bear with him, okay? Just bear with him. Now for the benediction. Oh, Father.
Father, I pray that you make your face shine upon us, that you'd be gracious to us, that you would grant us peace. And our rising up and our laying down, our going out and coming in both now and forevermore. God bless you. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon.